So as we move into a new age of business, a contextual age where we're studying much more data than we've ever had to study before, we need new kinds of data stores, new kinds of data innovation. And that probably means you're gonna need a Hadoop cluster somewhere in your data, data center or in your cloud. And con continuity is gonna show us how to do that without having a bunch of super nerds on staff like Facebook had. Um, anyways, we're gonna see continuity right now. And who are you? Hey, thanks for having me. My name's uh, Jonathan Gray. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a company called Continuity. Uh, so a little bit about myself and my background. Uh, I actually kind of came up around Hadoop and HBase uh, when they first got started as projects. So I had another startup um, that we were just talking about, you may have heard of, called Streamy.com. And Streamy.com was, we actually started it as a response to Facebook, which started back then. And it was, uh, Facebook was all about the people and this kind of social element to it. And we wanted to take a content approach. And so we built a social RSS reader. And we did RSS crawling, natural language processing, a whole real-time element of the whole thing. And that led us to move from a Postgres database to a Hadoop and HBase database. This was circa 2007. Yeah. So this was when HBase was not ready to do that, yeah. essentially. And so I was trying to you know, build this application, Streamy, on top of Hadoop and HBase, and it wasn't really ready. And so instead of being a user, I became a developer and started developing HBase and became one of the early committers of HBase and did a lot of that development. And basically, at that time, kind of already had the idea of starting continuity. You know, what I saw was, hey, Hadoop, HBase, there's this new technology influenced by Google and the papers they wrote, started by Yahoo, picking up now at companies like Facebook back then. Really different. Uh, really, I felt at the time going to be a game changer. You know, you could mix this OLAP workload with the OLTP workload. You could scale it out forever and not have to worry about that kind of stuff. And so I just loved that technology and, and clung on to that technology. And at the time really said, hey, this should be real time. And so my drum beat has kind of been, let's make HBase real time and let's make Hadoop support that better. So Streamy uh, didn't work out in the end. 2008, we kind of uh, started to fade, had a really hard time raising money as many companies did. And uh, that led me to Facebook. So joined Facebook uh, in early 2010 and really to do Hadoop and HBase stuff. Yep. So they were looking, uh, they made the decision to take Facebook messages. Yep. They were doing a whole new product around messages, right? Email integration, SMS integration, IM. And they made the decision to use HBase. And at the time I was one of the committers in HBase. They were looking for someone to come and help with this. They came knocking. Nine months later, I joined the company uh, really to, to do Facebook messages first and then look at across the company, what other applications would there be for HBase and doing more real-time stuff on top of Hadoop. Um, so Facebook messages went into production. Today that's tens of petabytes, four nines of reliability. Every IM you send on Facebook is stored and indexed in HBase and thus Hadoop. So I think that's surprising to a lot of people that yep. Hadoop is being used in this kind of way. But I think that's exactly the point of why continuity exists, which is Hadoop is you know, different things to different people. It's been a data warehouse, it's been a BI tool, it's been the data lake, but it's also been a transactional database for companies like Facebook. Yep. And the reason that Messages was such a successful project was technical excellence, right? It was the team there at Facebook was amazing. And through sheer heroics and brilliance was able to build great software, put it into production and make it run terrific. How does the rest of the world do that? Whether it's a very, very large organization that has a lot of developers, but a lot less sophisticated developers, yep. or how does a startup, right? You know, and they all need to do it. I, I, in my book, you know, Age of Context, I noticed that businesses are gonna need to know everything about everything. I don't even stop with some things about everything. No, everything about everything. And they're gonna need to know their customer in far deeper detail, maybe a hundred times, a thousand times more detail than they yep. have today. And I, I just had dinner with the guys who run the Ritz Carlton, you know, mm -hmm. worldwide, and they agree. So people like companies like that are gonna need new kinds of data stores, right? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And, but they don't have that team of super geeks that or super nerds that and the, the that and Mark Zuckerberg never gonna have had. them. And you know, it's a question. It's like, okay, does yeah, because if you're a super nerd and you worked for Mark Zuckerberg, are you gonna go work for the Ritz Carlton? And does, does, does Ritz Carlton is it does it sound right that Ritz Carlton needs ten distributed systems engineers to do their job? Probably do <laughs> if they today, wanted to today, today. Today they do, right? Yeah. But like that's just to me. That's always been the thing about this company I knew needed to be started was there's something wrong about that equation is yeah. this technology should make its way into the enterprise. The question is how? And to me, it's not by figuring out a way to train up 4 million distributed systems engineers. It's a way to make this technology way more consumable. Interesting. And, and that's what, that's you're what doing. we're doing. Okay. And so what, we, what we're doing is we've built an application server for Hadoop. Okay. So in very much the way that WebLogic, WebSphere, JBoss for the Java, JVM, kind of enabled a whole bunch of developers to build on top without reinventing the wheel every time. And you see a lot of that today, which is the big companies who are successful in Hadoop on HBase, they've built their own middleware stack. They've built their own management tools. They've built all their own libraries, right? And that's fine for an eBay or for a Facebook, but it's not fine necessarily for a bank, or it's definitely not fine for a two or three person startup who really is just trying to build some differentiated value somewhere, yeah. but is wasting all their cycles on Hadoop, yeah. on stuff that is not differentiated in any way. Right. right? And so the way that, that we really see ourselves is how do we enable people to focus on their differentiation? Focus Sorry. on your application development and, and really enable much faster time to market, much lower skills barrier. I bet you're gonna see two kinds of customers. One, one that already has a good Hadoop cluster going and it's trying to figure out what more to do with it, you know, and then somebody who ha hasn't done Hadoop or ha hasn't really gotten into big data, but is just coming in, you know, and, and playing around and then yeah. gonna get serious next year. How do you deal with both? Do, you know, I think. Do you force the the people who already have a Hadoop to move everything to your servers? How, how how do you work? That's a really great question. I mean, at a high level, I'd say our bread and butter today. If you're already using Hadoop, look, our, our sales pitch is Hadoop is hard. Right? You have to kind of under, get that proposition to yeah. want to buy what we're selling. If you've already used Hadoop, you totally get that. Completely understand how hard it is. If you haven't used it yet, if you've never picked it up yet. What we see is there's still a kind of a lack of appreciation for how hard it's going to be. It's still perceived as more of a traditional database or a traditional data warehouse. What makes it hard? What, what are some of the things that you guys at Facebook were doing that? that well, look, I, just just you just had look 10 at super just, nerds. <laughs> I think if you just look at like even how you consume a relational database or how you consume Hadoop and HBase, right? So when I download my SQL, I can create tables with different types of data in it. I can model it around, you know, there's different object relational mapping tools. You know, I can kind of understand how my data looks inside of a relational database, and the database gives tools for how to do it. It also gives me tools for asking questions of it, right? Like, I can join things, I yeah. can say, show me all the email addresses that match this domain, or who are all the people that have this last name? Select stars, dot star. Easy stuff in SQL, and easy stuff in a relational database, which has an engine. It has a query engine in it. Part of the thing that's great about HBase and Hadoop, but it's the trade-off, is there is no query engine, right? Hive has a query engine, right? So there are SQL engines on top of Hadoop that create processing engines. HBase itself has no query engine. Hadoop itself has no query engine. MapReduce so it's, it's just like an algorithm. A, it doesn't actually have any logic in it, right? So it's like a low-level uh, store, data I, store. I think of it as a kernel. Right. Kernel. Hadoop is like a kernel. It has very low level primitives, right? Hadoop is really just a file system for storing files. HBase is a column store for storing bytes. It's just a big byte bag, right? That sorts kind of like sorts stuff for you. The problem is I have to now apply a bunch of things on top of it to get the usage I want. And so for example, the easiest example I think is HBase schema design. Schema design in a relational database is very understood. Right? There's tools for it, there's different diagrams, there's, there's visual tools even for designing it. Well, HBase doesn't have the notion of a schema, really. Yep. HBase is just a big byte bag. And what you have to do is manipulate the bytes to give you different properties outside of it. And so I might sort it and group it and do different things by essentially bit twiddling. And you know, what happens is as soon as what you're talking about is HBase schema design and you're trying to design an efficient schema, yeah. What you're actually doing is distributed systems, right? Okay? Because HBase is all about distrib distribution. 
And so what you're doing is, okay, how do I design my schema so that I don't have a hot spot? If I have 100 nodes, yeah. if my schema makes it so that when I write, I'm always writing to one node, it's not a good schema. I want to distribute the load across 100 servers, right? Yeah. So HBase schema design is actually distributed systems design. Whereas relational database design has nothing to do with distributed systems. No. It has nothing to do with the underlying implementation of relational database, right? No, you want a bigger Oracle box, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Right, but relational the databases, databases, they're right? built on B-trees. Yeah. But people who are DBAs don't necessarily understand how a B-tree is implemented. No. Except people who are H-based DBAs understand how H-based is implemented. They understand the distributed architecture. There's no such thing as an H-based DBA today. Right? They're engineers. And that was the case at Facebook. Right? In the MySQL team, you had MySQL DBAs. You had an operations team around it. For the H-based team, it was the engineering team. Right? That's it. And yes, you had some ops people, but they tended to work hand in hand with the engineering team. It wasn't a separate kind of thing. And that's because there's no abstraction there. HBase is a very low level system. Yeah. And that's because things need to be built on top of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, what you're what, seeing. What drove uh, Zuckerberg and his team to go HBase? Was it performance? Was it uh, the fact that he knew that sharding had. <laughs> Shard it out, you know. Well, I remember. It's I remember hearing Mark and uh, another entrepreneur talking about their sharding systems and how, how complex it was. And this was five years ago, right? You imagine how you much know, growth has had has Facebook seen in five years, you know? But their primary store is still sharded MySQL. Yeah, <laughs> I think one of that's one of the really interesting things about how technology changes things so fast is one of the last projects I was on at Facebook was the project to essentially replace MySQL with HBase, right? For the big stuff, like my friend list and things like that. And we were doing a lot of experimentation. And it's really an analysis around cost, right? Because yeah. it's all about cost in the end. It's so much data, so many servers. And one day, the project died. The only reason the project died was they decided to go pure flash, right? So by taking their MySQL tier, putting it pure flash, right? Padding the books of Fusion IO, they were able to just say, you know what, now we can scale forever. Things, all the bottlenecks that went away are gone. You know, in essence, what was happening was the amount that they could store per server was so small because the disks are so slow. Yeah. By packing it with Flash, they could get a lot more density. Yeah. And now they don't need half a million MySQL servers. They could squeeze it into however many they could squeeze it into. So there's no point in investing all this time and effort into using a different storage system. Interesting. <laughs> So, uh, so, and so we just went SSD here, you know, went flash <laughs> here as well, uh, which has huge impacts on, on what you can do for uh, cloud computing customers. And what, what would they, when they fire, when you fire up a, a continuity system, yes. what do you so see? So we call our, our, our application server the reactor. the reactor. Okay. So when you install our software, you install it onto your Hadoop cluster, and now it's a reactor. And this is uh, a view of our local reactor. So we have two free products and two production products. Our two free products are the development kit, and that's a free download from our website, continuity.com. That's our SDK example kind of applications, all the tools, documentation, yep. and then our local reactor. So this is a single node version of the platform, runs on your laptop. It has an emulated version of Hadoop and HBase. So it's very lightweight, um, fully functional, but it's just obviously scale limited. So that's for free. We also have our sandbox reactor, which is available through Rackspace, and uh, spin that up 30 days for free, and you get your own VM in the cloud. And you can, it looks very much the same, but you can run it up, leave things running for long periods of time, and stuff like that. So basically, when you hit your Hadoop cluster, you see this. And what we give you is an application view of what you're doing. Yeah. So you're less concerned about Hadoop, and you're more concerned about my application, what different features does it have, what is it doing. All I did was hit continuity reactor start. Um, this starts up a little local reactor. Um, okay. I've deployed an application here. So you, you build your applications in Java, very much like you would for Tomcat or something like that. You build it into a jar and you deploy it. You deploy that with drag and drop. You can use REST, all different types of things. So once you deploy that, this kind of shows you how an application is structured. And this is a lot of what makes it easier. So instead of thinking about the Hadoop APIs and the different kind of core primitives that come out, we give you these capabilities. And so when you build, you collect data, process data, store data. So, so you can collect data. Yeah, so we have a kind of higher level, higher level set of 
of abstractions. We call them capabilities. So instead of worrying about the low-level APIs, you collect data, process data, store data, and query data. And so everything is around that, right? So event collection, for example, can actually be a complicated thing, right? How do I make a highly available fault-tolerant REST endpoint that allows clients anywhere to send data, and it's never going to go down, and it scales out to hundreds of thousands of ops a second, and I can monitor it, manage it, and guarantee it's up. So there's a whole bunch of different infrastructure someone would need to set up to do that. In our system, you create a stream, and all of those other things are taken care of for wow. you. Right? And so it's just, we've surrounded it with all of the different reusable stuff, all of the management capabilities, the, the kind of admin stuff to operationalize. We call it, talk a lot about operationalizing your application. It's one thing for a business analyst to run an ad hoc query against your database. You don't have to operationalize that process. If yeah. it's offline for a few hours, nothing breaks. Now, if that goes down and it's unavailable for three hours in the middle of the day, that's not gonna break your business, right? But if I'm actually running an online production system, for example, I'm doing personalization for my content site, or I'm, you know, I'm an ad tech company and my dashboards are really my product and that's what my end users use, I might serve all those out of Hadoop. It's a really big problem if that goes down. Yeah. And so operationalizing that type of application requires a lot of other systems. I need management, monitoring, metrics, logs, and those things tend to be hard on distributed systems when you're doing tens or hundreds of machines. Yep. And that's what our software really is oriented around, is making that easy. And so, you know, at a high level, we focus on the developer. And what that means is we focus on everything they need to do. Yep. When they sit in their IDE, they're using Eclipse, they're using IntelliJ, they start building out an idea. We give them example code, we give them libraries, we give them tools, we give them IDE plugins. We give them the local reactor. That enables them to do a lot of quick debugging very fast. They don't have to worry about hitting the cluster yet. When that works, then they hit the cluster. And then we really focus on how do you operationalize this? How do you manage the scalability? How do you look at the logs and the metrics so that it's easy to put into production? Right? A lot of the kinds of companies you're probably aiming at are, are going to be building worldwide infra infrastructure, and having just one da one data center ain't probably it, right? So, do you help them manage multiple Hadoop clusters around the world? Yeah, that's a really good question. We call it distributed distributed reactors. Distributed <laughs> distributed. <laughs> you know, because we kind of have our local reactor, and then we have our distributed reactor, which is a Hadoop cluster, and then there's like the distributed distributed and. You know, I think there's, there's two big use cases that we see. I'd say one is just disaster recovery. I need a copy somewhere else in case this explodes. And that tends to be, you know, in the non-real-time online applications where we're really focused today, not that big of a deal. Yep. Um, Hadoop has a lot of stuff for that. HBase has different, different replication stuff. What we see a lot of that's actually a really interesting use case is you want a presence in a bunch of data centers. This is a lot in ad tech. You want a presence in a bunch of data centers just for latency reasons, yep. right? Because anytime someone hits my tracking pixel or hits my banner or whatever, I need to have like a six millisecond response time or whatever their SLAs are. And a lot of times you just kind of have read copies out into all these different data centers. Yep. And so that's a really, really interesting pattern that we've, we, we uh, have an early customer they're not in production with, but it has that, that exact Sort of like kind Akamai, of, right? Akamai it, it's it's it. an interesting, it's it's kind of like Akamai in a lot of different ways. But Akamai does it with pages, not with databases. Right? <laughs> exactly. So. And so a lot of what the ad tech companies are doing is like user models or user feature lists or something like that where, you know, I want to be able to take a, a cookie, hit that ID, and then get back a whole bunch of different features that I can use to like drive a personalization uh, kind of system. So enabling those types of multi-tier systems, absolutely in our roadmap, you know, I think it's slightly outside the scope of what Hadoop is in the bread and butter of, but um, one thing that we always see is in big organizations, even small, it's not usually one cluster. Yep. And so we do have some other products, and it's actually, the we have a system called Loom, and Loom is the system that works with um, Rackspace to enable our self-service sandbox, right? So when you hit, you know, create me a sandbox, we actually hit the Rackspace OpenStack endpoints, we provision a new cluster, we deploy the software on it using Chef, we configure it all, start it all, configure DNS, and then we hand it over. And all that is a self-service system. We use the same system to enable kind of our developers to debug and um, do testing on our software. So a developer might say, hey, I have a new feature I'm testing, I want to run some performance tests, give me a 10 node, 
Hadoop cluster in rack space on these types of nodes. Go. And so that kind of notion of creating clusters on demand and configuring them and managing them, um, we also have some software around that. And that's really where we hope to next year take it towards these startups, take it towards people who, you know, today I think it's a travesty. Like there's all these startups that are coming out and they have a visualization tool. They have a very vertical approach to big data. They want to do UIs or, or an algorithm. They have to hire Hadoop developers. They have to understand the whole ecosystem of big data to just enable their differentiation. And to me, to really get this market where we want, it's all about the applications. And we have to figure out how do we enable those companies to focus on getting their stuff to market really quick, yeah. not, fo not forcing them to enter the same job market that I'm competing in, which is to hire a bunch of Hadoop developers, right? Yeah. And they're, they're, uh, a startup has uh, traffic that's very, very spiky compared to a bank, right? A bank is going to, the traffic flows are going to be pretty, pretty uh, smooth and, and straightforward. How, do you, how does your system help a startup react in, in that spiky world? Can you, yeah, can you open I, up new servers and scale out and, and then collapse servers as, as demand goes away? I or? think there's like this age old question in the valley and in startups and all this stuff, which is, you know, don't, don't pre-optimize. You know, it's like, do I, and this is one of the mistakes we did at streaming yet, you know, was like we could have scaled forever. Unfortunately, we didn't get a user base, so it was pointless. Yeah. Right, <laughs> but we paid a lot of cost on the engineering side in order to support scale, even though we didn't have it. So that's one of the questions today. It's like when you know, when I was in the HBase community a lot and was really involved there, it was a lot of you don't you probably shouldn't be using this. This is really hard. If you don't need it, don't use it. You know, my hope is that that can change. Is yeah. that by by creating much more developer accessibility and then by having more of the cloud-based solutions. So now developers have a much easier programming experience, and they also don't have to operate and manage to do. If you can make it scale down effectively, then why not enable a startup to easily build on top of Hadoop? And then, shit, they could scale 10x when they need to scale, right? Today, there's like this decision. It's like, do I build on the unscalable solution, and then if I'm successful, rebuild it? Or do I take the cost of building on the scalable solution so that I'm hedging against the future? Twitter went through that for three years, right? I, exactly. With fail whale. <laughs> so, you know, can, can you make a, a solution such that startups can actually start on a scalable infrastructure? Yeah. But it's not so hard. And, right? not, and not have to switch later. And not have to switch, right? Because switching is, hard, is harder. Huge cost. Yeah. Huge cost. But, you know, from personal experience, pre-optimizing and handling all of that scale when you don't have traction, ends up using a lot of your resources, and ultimately yeah. it's not your product, it's not what you're differentiating on. So probably not where you should spend all your time. Yep. It's a lean startup method, right? Exactly. Eric Reese. Exactly. Um, what else does a developer need to know about your system, about continuity? Well, you know, I'd say where our current focus is, is been around building more and more applications. And so, you know, one of the problems I'd say we have today, and we talked about it a bit, which is, you know, people already using Hadoop, people new to Hadoop. One of the problems selling to people who are new to Hadoop is they don't always know what they can do, yeah. right? Hey, here, we have a horizontal platform. You can build anything you want on it. Well, if someone who can self-select can pick that up and say, I know what I want to build. If I don't know what I want to build, it's maybe I have certain types of data, but I don't know what apps I can build. Yeah. Or, you know what, I'm just looking for, you know, expanding my horizons as a developer. I want to get some new jobs. I hear this Hadoop thing is cool. What can I do with it? How do I play with it? And so, you know, NetLend is an example of one application that we're building um, around network security data. So you put in network data, and you can get all different types of analytics. You can do threat detection, anomaly detection. Uh, one we have is called GeoSentiment. That takes Twitter data and looks at different terms and follows the sentiment across different geographic areas over mm -hmm. time. Very, very interesting. Uh, we if you're have at Nielsen, one. you could probably take that code and rewrite it for TV ratings, right? That's exactly what we're doing. So we build out these kinds of base applications. We give them away. They're open source. And people can take those in the direction for their company, right? But our goal is always get a customer, get a developer as far down the path of solving their problem as we can. And they can pick up what we have and, and use it. So we're trying to sell a platform. But we build applications on top open source, give them away. It's all about here's best practices, here's ideas of what you can do, here's how we can get you really far down that path of solving whatever your problem is. 
And so that's, Uber, that's what you'll see us doing is building more and more of these apps. What, one of the things when I talked to Mark Andreessen, you know, we, we were like, oh, the world is going to get Uberized. You know, in other words, Uber and you know, Travis, who runs Uber, gets to see every customer, every, every transaction, every uh, employee in real time on a map, right? You know, he can see it all in his mobile phone. Is that all running on Hadoop? And is that the kind of thing that you think enterprises are going toward that everything needs to be Uberized so that you can yeah, I think so. I mean, like, walk look, around look and see every customer in real time? One company who I, I love is Salesforce. And if you look at the new stuff they just did with yeah. their... Salesforce One. Yeah, and look, you know, you can essentially build customized apps per your enterprise on the mobile device. You know, and talking to customers, the big customers we talk to, that's the trend. It's like, it, it was this funny thing at Facebook where it's like, hey, there's a Facebook messages app. Right, even though you can get to messages through the Facebook app, yep. that extra click actually really changes engagement. Yep. <laughs> you want an app for each thing you do. Yep. And so there's this this push towards towards you know some say consumerization of stuff or wh whatever you want to call it, but there's this definite push towards that. And I think what falls behind that is the notion to create custom applications to do some customization behind this stuff. And Salesforce is a platform that's trying to enable more and more of that. You know, I think we're taking a kind of lower level approach, but at some point, you know, I think these things all, all converge. And so whether it's this consumerization of stuff, this internet of things, all of these different trends, data is everywhere. People need to figure out how to mangle this data, how to wrangle it, how to either gain insight out of it, how to direct it, how to make decisions according to it. And ultimately, what's cool about Hadoop is it's a scalable platform. So you don't worry about the scale of your stuff. Do you have any com competition? We have you know, different types of competitors. I think we're pretty uniquely positioned today as the app server for Hadoop. Um, there's a big company out there called Pivotal that you may have heard of. Uh, from a positioning standpoint, they're very similar to us, focused on applications and developers, things like that. There's other companies out there like Wibby Data um, who are more focused, I'd say, on the application development side. And so they're focused on different verticals and really delivering specific solutions for those verticals. Um, but on a platform like Hadoop and HBase. Very cool. Yeah. How, how are you guys funded? Tell me something about the company. The yeah, fundamentals so of the company. we're two years in. We've raised 12 and a half from uh, Andres That's a lot. Andreessen, um, Battery Ventures, and Ignition Partners, and uh, have really you know, top tier VCs that are all amazing partners for us. Really good, also, group of, of angels, the Data Collective. Um, and uh, Paul Ambrose actually is on our board and is one of our investors. He was the founder and CEO of WebLogic. So, you know, we're very much kind of trying to, to build on those trends, right, where the app server came out kind of 15 years ago. And it, there was a huge market around that, a whole bunch of different companies built around it. And I think the opportunity is even bigger today because the data opportunity is so big. So we're, we're very excited. We've got a really good, good team, good group of investors. Sell, sell, sell. Sounds like you're off to the races. Yeah. You're in the middle of the world in this new age of context. So, uh, where do we learn more about it? Continuity.com. Right. Check it out. You can download your development kit. You can get your Rackspace sandbox started up, and uh, all good. I'll be an HBase developer sooner or later. There you no, go. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks a lot.